Hi, hello. Hello, hi. Nice to meet you. I guess we can just hello. wait for five minutes until Jota shows up. All right, it's five minutes plus now. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Mikhail and well, I volunteered to facilitate this uh, book club. And I guess we can 
after me, I would like if you can introduce um, ourselves and our motivation while we're doing this. Well, for me, I have no prior experience with spatial statistics before, uh, but I want to read through this because I'm interested in applying spatial statistics to microscopical images on human tissues, because I noticed that apparently um, it seems that uh, people who are working on this kind of problems are sort of reinventing the wheel instead of just taking over the decades or the uh, massive amount of knowledge that people in geostatistics has accumulated. I'm not entirely sure why. I guess people are just not talking to each other, right? So yeah, I'm interested to know um, how um, all of this um, spatial data analysis are working and hopefully um, try to apply this to my own work. So that's all for me. And Flores, would you mind introduce yourself next? Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'm Floris van der Hagen. I'm, I work at the Research Institute for Nature and Forest in uh, Belgium. Um, and so I have a background in ecology and I, I'm working on uh, designing uh, monitoring networks for uh, yeah, natural environments. And uh, so I do use some spatial techniques as well. And so I'm very keen on learning more uh, about spatial statistics. Nice having you here. And the last, oh, I could not. Um, is it uh, Federica? Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Federica Gazzelloni. I'm in Italy. Uh, I'm an Italian statistician and I'm also spe uh, specialized in a child science. Uh, I did uh, quite a certain number of uh, book clubs here with this um, R for Data Science community. And uh, I'm also interested in uh, uh, spatial uh, data analysis. Uh, this is the reason for which I'm following this book club. Thank you. Yeah, nice having you all here. So let me share my screen. Well, there are not a lot of things going to be discussed in the first uh, meeting for sure, but I guess we can. Um, so, of course, after this first meeting, I would like to invite you all to fill in your names as a presenter for the subsequent chapters. And well, if I look at the chapters, I haven't looked at, I haven't looked through everything, but it seems that several chapters can be merged into one because I find that one chapter is very short, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, I wouldn't want to risk uh, burning out uh, ourselves too soon, especially given the number of chapters this book has. So I guess we can just uh, go through the weeks and see how it goes whether people are still around or whether we're still interested in um, reading through the book. Um, but yeah, would be great if you could uh, fill in your names and um, yeah, volunteer for, to present the next time. And okay, it seems, okay, John put um, this three weeks of break in between well, for the like savings madness. Though, I guess I understand that we are all now in Europe, so not supposed to be a problem. So I'm in the Netherlands, by the way, um, but we'll see. Maybe people from other countries are also going to join in the next or the uh, subsequent sessions. Uh, it so, be a problem, I think. Um, it's just it will... In, in our time zone, it is 17 o'clock now, so it yeah. will switch in those weeks I have seen to 16 uh, o'clock and then back to 17. So um, because it is uh, defined as 10 o'clock central time. Mm -hmm. 
but it's I no think, problem for me. Yeah, I think the problem is if there are someone from the US, for example, are also joining because I believe that they, the time they start or end the daylight saving is not exactly similar as Europe. So I understand that it brings some confusion in other book clubs. So rather than um, attending the meeting and seeing no one because of the time confusion, I guess uh, John put it uh, some uh, breaks in between, but I mean, um, as far as I can tell, if all the attendees are in one region like us, then I don't think there's no need to uh, put these breaks in between, but we'll see. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so, yes, for the presentation, I understand that um, people can also um, put their notes in the uh, book down format. Well, I don't have a lot of experience with that. And especially with this one, uh, with this chapter, um, well, first of all, there are no exercises. So I guess uh, we can just go through um, the key points in this chapter and maybe discuss some things along the way. And I'm not entirely sure though, um, for the next chapters, are there no exercises at all or uh, not? Yeah, so um, let me quickly check. Hmm. Uh, there's no exercises here. I think it's all demo code. So it's just a matter yeah. of playing with the code that is uh, shown, I think. Yeah, I think so. Oh, too bad, but it's also nice. Uh, there's no burden of doing all the exercises, uh, but yeah. So um, I'll try my best. And if you have another way to explain uh, the things that I'm trying to explain, then feel free uh, to interrupt me to add or uh, correct me. So um, yeah, spatial data, apparently there are a lot of types of spatial data at first. It's a bit confusing to me because here uh, the author say that there are three types of spatial data, but then I see six types uh, or six subchapters in this chapter one. But then apparently, as we will see later, the fourth, fifth, and sixth can be seen as a combination of all of these three types of spatial data in one way or another. So I'm not entirely sure what all of this, uh, I'm not even entirely sure how to read all of this, but I guess the most important point is that this um, D or domain, the difference so it can um, appear differently in the various categories of spatial data and hence the um, categorization. So um, I'm still not entirely sure um, about the exact difference or why it all are, um, all of this data are categorized differently. But I think as we go through the demo code, because here for the uh, next, for the subsequent chapters, um, the book are divided into the three categories of spatial data. Uh, we should understand more about these uh, differences. So first the aerial data. So I think this is, um, a bit easy to understand. So in aerial data, the number of events are aggregated in area. So if you have ever seen this word map of disease distribution, 
and you can see that the um, oh well we have the examples here um, yeah it's always like this oh the zooming in or out is not very nice so aerial data at first to me it was a bit confusing because to my um well as a speaker of english a second language area aerial or spatial means exactly the same thing to me uh, but of course it's different uh, technically so aerial data the number of events is aggregated according to a certain order or a certain region and in this case it is aggregated i guess by district or town and the number are can be anything can be in this case the number of infant deaths can also be the other way around the number of births so as long as the events are aggregated um, all of the events that are occurring within an area is aggregated then we can call this aerial data and the differences will be more obvious as we go through the other types so for the geostatistical data so the events that we are interested in can occur or can be observed practically everywhere within a certain domain and you can think of it like so here they gave the example of lead concentrations so so there are these observations of the lead concentrations but obviously you can find lead at the other points that are not sampled um, because well supposedly so the lead supposed to be present uh, or not in um, across this region um, but because of the limitations in our sampling then we can only observe the lead concentration within a certain region or it can also be like i guess like um, uh, weather or pollution index maybe so pollutants can can be present everywhere um, but the sensors to detect those pollutants are limited they are just they are scattered in a few places not present in everywhere but using the data that are sampled by the sensors we can then use the data to predict for example how is the pollution in other areas that are not sampled so that's how i understand geostatistical data um, so far and they, they also uh, the author also gave this other example on um, rent prices and malaria prevalence um, okay. and yeah for the point patterns so at first it was not very obvious to me what was the difference between geostatistical data and point patterns because the data that we we're looking at are sort of similar that we're looking at dots uh, overlaid on top of a map for example here you can see dots um, um, so this is for forest fire i believe um, in spain and the dots depict the location of the fires i believe but then the nature of the dots are completely different between geostatistical data and point patterns so in geostatistical data supposedly the events or the observations that you care about 
can occur virtually everywhere within the region that you're interested in. But because of the limitation of the sampling method, then you are then you have only the data for a certain patch in your domain. Whereas for point patterns, the events occur sporadically. Um, here we have the example of forest fires. And well, maybe the fire eventually engulfed the whole forest, but for sure, there are points in which the fires first started. And another example is this. Um, yeah, I think the location and types of cell in the tissue. So the observation that you see is the event that you're actually interested in. So I think um, it's very important to uh, know that even though maybe um, like the table looks very similar between just the geostatistical data and point patterns, but the data generating process are, or the um, nature of those data points are completely different. And um, oh, if you want to add something, please um, go ahead, by the way. And then for the speech, yeah. I think you're completely right uh, with your explanation. So uh, it's uh, the events which are not everywhere which uh, are typical for the point pattern data yes yeah good to have someone to validate so yeah and as for the spatial temporal data i believe it can be any of the um any of the above type of data but then you add a layer of time or a layer of this temporal process on top of the observations that you are seeing uh, I believe uh, we've seen, uh, for example, um, changes in COVID incidents over the years or over the months or even over the course of days uh, during the pandemic, how it increases and decreases um, over a certain period of time. So I guess like it or not, we are sort of exposed to those type of data um, already. Um, and then for the spatial functional data, then this is a combination of all of the three types of um, data before. And here, um, so they give an example of the um, temperature measurement. So I guess the, yeah, but I'm not entirely sure about the point pattern nature of this example. Um, it is about uh, weather stations. So it is also geostatistical data here because you can yeah. measure this everywhere, but you just measure it in a sample. The way I understand this, I was also a bit uh, confused at first when reading uh, this paragraph but mm -hmm. I believe that actually the spatial temporal data are just one case of spatial functional data. And they actually, mm -hmm. for example, is also spatial temporal data. The example they give in 1.5 is a is a spatial temporal. Yeah. It's yeah. Um, and as I believe I understand it, the spatial functional data, it, it is about actually uh, a function that you want to describe so to model uh, between two variables mm -hmm. uh, which you measure at different locations so and those variables can be time and some response which is the example given here which is i think a bit confusing but at least that is my understanding yeah i'm also um like i'm also confused because um and maybe the author doesn't mean that all of the spatial data has to be present within the function. Um, maybe it can be only one or two, not necessarily all three has to be, all three elements has to be present because uh, looking at this, 
Well, I'm not entirely sure what is the aggregate within the uh, region. Well, I do see that here, like what you pointed out, that is a geophysical data with temporal layer. Um, but I guess we don't have to be fixated on this. Maybe we oh, can. Uh, I think, yeah, I see what you mean because it is indeed um, stated that the three types of spatial data are combined with random functions, but I think uh, I'm pretty sure um, they just mean, just as in spatial temporal data, that one of those three types is um, taken and combined with a function because no. uh, the, the the example given is geostatistical data and it is also explicit uh, is explicitly set like that it says under example it says the example below shows functional geostatistical data so mm -hmm. you have functional geostatistical data spatial functional data and functional point patterns it is in the third uh, paragraph on under the title of uh, 1.5 so it is either yeah. one of those three but uh combined with a function so mm -hmm. there's a some response you have a predictor and response so to say yeah and i think I, spatial temporal data is no difference it is an example i think i think so too and looking at the equation seems that the key difference is in this part that the x is a random variable whereas here it's a function so um well i believe uh, but well, anyway, and um, yeah, I'm not yeah. entirely sure how yeah. this mobility data can mm -hmm. be categorized because first the author said that well, there are these three types of um, spatial data, and for this one, um, I guess it can be um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure it's whether it um can be categorized into aerial statistical point patterns but it, for sure this mobility data means that there are some movement that there are some um i think it uh, it, it it's a very good example a uh, very good example to illustrate um the type of data um so i think this is the uh, yeah, number of travelers between the Brazilian states for to predict and visualize spread of infectious diseases, which is very relevant in this uh, in the current years. And yeah, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, I guess it can be classified as aerial data, but that there are some movement um, across the regions. Not entirely sure, or is it just some completely? Oh goodness, the zooms. Well, sorry about that. But anyway, um, yeah. So a lot of types of data, a lot of examples, and I think it. Well, it is for me. It is nice to know that there are this categorization into all of this uh, spatial data and by looking at the um, how the chapters are divided it seems that the approach are different uh, for all of these types of data and indeed um, because we only see this aerial statistical or spatial point patterns um headings for the subsequent chapters and i guess we can see how this uh spatial temporal spatial functional data or mobility data, mobility data maybe could be explained in interspersed manner throughout all of the next chapters so um yeah that's it for me uh for uh the first meeting uh i have nothing else to add and um, yeah um if there is uh, no further question is there any questions or remarks or i believe that federica has left 
numerous uh, book clubs before. Um, this was my first time after uh, a two year break of facilitating book clubs. So I'm a bit rusty. Um, so if you have any suggestions in facilitating the book club in how to make sure that the book club can progress smoothly and we can get the maximum benefits out of this, so not just wasting our time, I would be very happy to receive your advice. Oh. Uh, yeah, mm, I think it's, um, it's just a matter of interest uh, on the topic. So we usually divide uh, our chapters, um, people choose uh, their favorite on the Google Sheet, put down their, their name, and then uh, what, so the, the role of the facilitator is to cover them up in case they cannot attend the session that they booked uh, previously. Um, and so it, it usually uh, the, the first session is always a bit more crowded than the other ones, the following the sessions as for, for, for many reasons, because uh, they somehow uh, take part in the first session, look at the, the, the book, but they that somehow can happen, they cannot attend the other session. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you keep going forward uh, and do your chapters. Uh, I'll, I'll sign up for uh, for one, as soon as I, I'm, I'm a bit busy at the moment, but um, I really I like this topic. I, I've participated to some challenges for making maps and everything, so I like to use R for making maps, and so I'm interested in uh, improving the skills. Um, just this, I think it's a, uh, it's a good way to learn together and to finally go through the entire book because it's somehow uh, when you work, when you have other things to do alone, it's a bit hard to do. Uh, so, so thank you for facilitating this book club so we can, we can read it through. <laughs> and thank you for attending. Um, yeah, so. Thank you. Um, well, um, Noticing that um, normally the first um, session there are more people than in others. We are only three persons now, so um, it will yeah. be a bit more intensive if, if no other people join in uh, future sessions. But I'm uh, keen on following up uh, this, uh, so I'm uh, ready to to take. Uh, everyone every now and then uh, and do yeah. a chapter so i have next week i have another uh, presentation for another book club so i'd rather yeah. not do next week but the week after that i have uh, put my name in there oh nice well um at least for the uh next week uh, well at least for the early chapters it's not that long so i can also do the second one for sure um and, that also applies to the class of the chapters, I believe. Well, I haven't looked through all of the 23 chapters or the append, well, in excluding the appendix for sure, but to me, it doesn't seem to be uh, that long, I guess. Uh, wow. For me, it's uh, it can become quite heavy if chapters oh, are yeah. combined because simply I yeah, don't yeah. have very much oh, time yeah. to read. No, no, for sure. What I mean is that I think even if we go through one chapter at a time, it should not be uh, that burdening. Uh, I hope, I hope, mm -hmm. but then of course life happens. Maybe you're participating in a, um, a more book clubs and then even one short chapter can look um, scary at times. Well, I understand that. So and I mean, maybe the over the chapters, the book is not uh, looking really good, and then motivation falls off. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. So I think let's just see how it goes, and I guess that's it for today. Okay.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you. So see you next week. Yeah, see you. Goodbye. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye.